We're very excited to have with us Kate Hill from the compliance team. But before we turn it over to Kate, uh, just a couple quick housekeeping items. We are recording today's session. So if you're not able to join us for the entire time, or if you have a coworker or friend that you'd like to share this with, it will be on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. So we hope you'll check that out. We've got a ton of great content on there. During the session today, if you would like to uh, ask a question, please use the chat or Q&A function, which you can find by hovering your mouse either at the top or bottom of the screen, depending on which view mode you're in, and some options will pop down. Um, we will be taking questions throughout. Carolyn and myself will act as moderator, and Kate will be happy to answer those. So without further ado, Kate, I believe it's time to turn it over to you. All righty, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here in uh, Indiana, and so this is a lot of material here. Some of it will go a little quicker and some a little slower, depending on your questions or not, okay? So here we go. So today we hope to accomplish to learn the most commonly seen deficiencies, tips to prevent those, of course, and then methods to stay compliant. That always is important. Okay, so it really does start with being organized. You will do much better if you keep yourself organized in terms of, well, pretty much everything but compliance for sure. So develop a survey readiness binder, put your policies, your reports, and other evidence of compliance all together. Now, if it's online, as many times now it is, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Determine who will attend uh, the survey and how to inform them. Keep your clinic company ready. If you're, you know, you never have to worry about somebody dropping in if you're no dishes in the sink kind of thing. That's one of my big bugaboos. So I wash dishes a lot. And then the staff should know where everything is stored. Okay. That is really important because if you as a manager are out that day, things go sideways very quickly. And so we want to share our knowledge with the staff on what's going on. And remember, this is an open book test. There should be no surprises. You know what the rules are. You know what the rules are when you're driving your car. And if you didn't stop at that stop sign, there's going to be a penalty if somebody's watching. And so, or worse, right? And so you know the rules. So live by them and you can rest easier. So the real nice way to do that is to occasionally, and I won't put a time on it, is to conduct a mock survey with your staff. So the clinic and its staff are in compliance with all federal laws and regulations. So you hold a kickoff conference with your staff and prepare them for this on-site visit that you're going to have today. Complete a walkthrough of the clinic with your checklist in hand. Can you answer yes to all the questions? Are there areas of concern that need more attention? Have a red pen with you to mark those. Then sit down and look at your policies and make sure, first, have they been reviewed within 10 years? Do you have all the policies? Are they complete? If you're provider-based, are you using hospital policies? Or do they mention the clinic? Does it say all entities associated with that hospital? And that's fine, but they need to include you. And then your binder would say, ABC Clinic follows the hiring, training, and orientation policy of the hospital. Perfectly acceptable. Interview your staff to ensure their knowledge about clinic policies, procedures, and, of course, their individual job responsibilities. And they should be comfortable answering questions. If they can't answer it, they need to know where to go to look for the answer. That's critical. And then finish with a wrap-up conference to discuss any areas of concern that need to be addressed prior to the survey. Once you're confident that you are survey ready, take time to celebrate your accomplishments. Now, one of the first things you want to remember is you never want to move your rural health clinic, especially not in this time with census issues and hypsis for withdrawal and all those things. Make sure you know that where you're moving to is in a HIPSA because where you are right now, you're grandfathered in, okay? And if you change your name, do a change of information in your in PECOS for the clinic. And the other thing that you need to notify and the state of is the medical director. Who is your medical director? And I see that my dog got a tablet and it's making me crazy. Uh, and and uh, is it reported? It goes on a CMS 29 and that goes to your state or to your accreditor. Now, during COVID, we've had a lot of times uh, where we had clinics temporarily closed for very good reasons, a small clinic, two providers, and they're both sick, all these kinds of things. So um, during COVID, CMS could not take administrative actions with respect to temporary closures, but you are expected to resume operations and or voluntarily terminate your number, which you're not going to do, within 30 days of the public health emergency being lifted. 
So if you've changed your hours as a result of COVID, and we have seen that, make sure you notify the state that you have new hours and we're now have to be closed on Friday till we hire somebody or whatever, if that is the case, just make sure you're, you're in compliance. Now, RHCs are permitted to provide their physician services outside the clinic, and that includes, it includes in the patient's home, that's a provider, in Part A of a SNF, that's your swing beds, at the scene of an accident or in a mobile unit. And so all those count toward the hours. I should put administrative time counts for that 50% rule for your NPs, but you must document all those things. Where was that person to count for those hours? Now, a physician who provides RHC services also to be to provide services elsewhere uh, that are not in the RHC, so is an NP, and those are billed separately. And there's a written agreement for such, and you check with your cost provider, your cost report preparer for those things. Now, an RHC can be a mobile or a permanent unit a fixed permanent structure, a mobile unit, or a permanent structure, which also provides RHC services in a mobile unit. And that's new. That's the piece that was added recently. So you can add a mobile unit to your billing number at your RHC. That's done by a change of information in your uh, in PECOS in your 855, and you'll list the locations where they're going to be. Each location, of course, must be in a HIPSA. You must publicize those days and times where we're going to be a Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Thursday, whatever. You can change them, certainly, but you just go in and update the information. Now, an RHC that's only mobile must come, so a, an, uh, an entity that's gone through an 855 and it's just a mobile unit uh, with all conditions in that unit, you must apply to, you must comply with every regulation of RHCs. But if it's an addition to your clinic, then you only have in there what you need. I have a checklist. If somebody would like that, be glad to send that out. So you, you have to be safe, secure. You have to have emergency drugs, but you might not need everything that you have in your emergency box in your, in your clinic. So these are examples of mobile clinics. You, there is an USDA a grant money right now for mobile units. So you want to check with somebody that knows about that because there's money to be had and to be given to you for this purpose. Does your name match what's on your 855A? Let me tell you, you, you can't believe how often this comes up. We drive up to a clinic and instead of saying Kate's clinic, it says Dr. Smith's clinic and it didn't move. Not the billing number is the same, but they changed their name. That's fraught with problems, depending on if your search surveyor is very generous or not. You could have all kinds of citations. The policies don't match. This doesn't match. That doesn't match. The unbelievable. So make sure if you change your name, well, here's what I would recommend. Go to QCOR, qcor.cms.gov, and check what CMS says is the name of your clinic. That's a great resource for you to go and make sure that you're calling yourself by what CMS has you as, because you bill under that number, so they might not have caught it, but driving up for survey, they're going to catch it. So make sure, change your name, update your information in your 855. One of the problems we're having throughout the uh, last couple of years is pre-filled syringes. So once a vaccine is inside a syringe, it's really difficult to tell what vaccine it is, which can lead to medication errors, even marked. Pre-filled syringes lead to wastage and increase the risk of vaccine storage under inappropriate conditions. Most syringes are designed for immediate administration and not for vaccine storage. Bacterial contamination and growth can occur in those syringes and, and because they don't contain bacteriostatic agents. Now, if you buy pre-filled syringes, that's a different story. They come in the glass syringe. You don't put the needle on until you're ready to administer. Never put the needle on ahead of time. So really very important. There is no sterility data available for those vaccines stored in plastic vaccine uh, syringes. The vaccine components can interact with the syringe, with the plastic, and reduce the potency. Pre-filling is a violation of medication administration guidelines which state that an individual should only administer medications he or she has prepared or drawn up. So you gotta remember about quality, patient safety with those pre-filled. You don't wanna have those. I know you do it for pre, for flu season. It's not a good idea. Okay, most things in the clinic, including the medications, but the equipment for sure, runs, we, we live by the manufacturer's instructions for use. Is there documentation that mechanical and electric equipment is regularly inspected and tested? Are they maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations? 
If the documentation is missing, review the policy to determine if the policy was not followed or is incomplete. And always, if you have a question, go to those manufacturer's instructions for equipment, uh, uh, manufacturer's instructions for use to know if it needs a biomedical check or does it need an inspection? Does it need a light bulb and a battery or a biomedical engineer to make sure like an EKG unit that it's reading properly? The other big, uh, actually, actually a larger survey problem we're having is the vial problem. For some strange reason, recently, we, I say recently, this is running about three years now, and I'm bound and determined to fix this, but I don't talk to everybody, so I can't, but single dose vials have no preservative in there. So it is, it is possible, and I promise you it's possible. We hear it. We hear, heard it yesterday on a survey in another state. Possibly a staff member did not know the difference. And that is, I hate to say, but typically an MA. They didn't know the difference. Nobody ever taught them there's a difference between a multi-dose and a single-dose vial. Possibly the drug's been coming to you as an MDV all along, and with shortages and whatnot, it's now an SDV, and nobody read that. Possibly we store them all together on the same shelf, making it confusing. So we can store them separately. That's one number one. We go back and train all our staff. I'm going to challenge you. Your homework as a result of this number one assignment is to go in your clinic and ask each individual individually. Your RNs better well know this, but what the difference is between a single dose file and a multi-dose file. All right and tell them why there's no preservative in that single dose vial. Uh, and you can buy little stickers. So um, single dose vials, never dated, once entered, gone, trash. Multi-dose vials labeled for 28 days or unless the expiration date is sooner. So single dose vials, never dated, multi-dose vials, 28 days. So this clinic had a, as they went through our call series prior to survey, they had a problem. And so they did a little test. They got this little red container and they and anybody that took a vial out of the cabinet was not permitted to put it back in for one month. And only one nurse a day was assigned to that. And she, uh, uh, how do I say, identified the culprit. So they did have someone who did not know the difference. And that's, we're giving, are we giving safe medication? Are we giving ineffective medication? Very, very important. CMS has said one, single dose vial with a 28 day date on it is a failed survey, no matter what else is happening that day. And we've had it happen. That's the only deficiency. So don't be that. And of course, most importantly is that it's about the patient for sure. So I'm going to challenge you for medical assistant education. CNAs come from a course and they've got a certificate and we know what they learn. MAs do not. Most of it's a lot of OJT. So we want to find out what they know, then train them and document that training. So you don't have that problem and, and who knows what else. Your medication management, of course, is a big subject, as we just saw in two is examples. Is there a robust medication policy? Are all the drugs secured in the clinic? Are drugs stored according to manufacturer's instructions? Are all medications delivered in the clinic properly documented in the EMR? So when you deliver a medication, I'm not talking about handing a sample, medication administration within the clinic. In the EMR are five rights, the right patient, of course, the right medication, the right dose, the right route, and the right time. Doctor ordered it, and we're going to give it. Uh, and I should say the right lot number. I have to add that there. The lot number for administrated, administered medications in the clinic needs to be in the EMR. Is every person dealing with drugs trained on vials? Is everyone trained on safe injection practices? There are wonderful um, CDC um, webinars called Lunch and Learns, and you, you find them and you show it during a lunch period and we do a little education. Log it. Log it as education. And is there a proper receipt for a scheduled drug? So anything that's a controlled substance needs to be controlled and there needs to be a log, even if it's the patient's bottle of testosterone. Where did every dose in that bottle go? And uh, is that, that patient's names on that log? So there's no diversion. 
So under medical direction, every rural health clinic must be an MD or a DO. He or she must be licensed in the state of Indiana. In your case, the medical director is a reportable event, as I already said. There is no waiver for medical director. So CMS provides a reasonable time to come back into compliance. You don't apply for a waiver. You just have to find one document, document, document. We lost our medical director on April 1st. We have made these four attempts to find a medical director, and we're looking for one. You can have a uh, locum tenens medical director um, uh, for the short term, okay? But you will have a violation if you continue not to have a medical director. There's no time in the guidance, um, but we, co we would collaborate with the regional office to see uh, what their plan is. Now, the ownership of a clinic is disclosed, and that means in the 855A, you do not have to have a sign on the door that says, I own this clinic. So you're organized in an org chart. There's an individual sign with day-to-day -day operations, and all types of staff are identified in a policy, along with functions and responsibilities. So the, clin the surveyor is going to ask to see the clinic's administrative and clinic clinical policies. Now for provider-based clinics, when the patient enters a provider-based clinic, they must be aware that they are entering an entity of the main provider, even though you're unique as a rural health clinic, and that means signage. So Kate's clinic is a somewhere in that sign is going to say um, a division of so-and-so hospital or a subsidiary of whatever your words are or nothing, just St. Joe's Hospital underneath, that kind of thing. So you, you do have a little bit different uh, responsibility in terms of ownership. Clean and orderly was the only uh, place in the regulations until 491.8D came, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, that's COVID, uh, where you could cite infection prevention. Prevention works, we know this. Hand washing is the most effective method of preventing the spread of infection. Our single use devices used only once, critically important. How are your clinic, clinic surfaces clean? Does the person wiping down those tables know the wet time? Does it kill HIV and hep B? Is the staff thoroughly trained on high level disinfection depending on what you're disinfecting? How do you dispose of your medical waste? Is there pest control? You have bugs walking around. Are the overhead lights full of dust? And is the staff trained on point of care devices? That's your six lab tests that you must do. And has someone actually been trained to do that? Yes, they're wave tests, very low evidence of um, error, but they should still know how to do it. And somebody suggested to me the other day, they can't do that job if they're colorblind. And that had never been brought up to me before. So you might wanna think about that. So that's a lot of questions. Do you know the answers to all of them? And you will have these slides, so you can review this later. Now, if you're sterilizing uh, equipment in a tabletop sterilizer in the clinic, I usually put oh my on this slide because 98% of the time, it's a citation, it's a deficiency. And here's what we're going to do if you have that unit. So I urge you to do it today. Second assignment, go back to the clinic, find the manufacturer's instructions for use for that unit and read how to care for it, how to sterilize instruments, how to clean it. Is there supposed to be spore testing? What goes with that? You know, that's what we're gonna do. And then we find out it doesn't match your policy. So you wanna have 100% compliance that when you hand an instrument to a provider for a procedure, that it's sterile. You want it sterile when they're operating on your arm for a, a, a close a wound or something. And so every patient deserves the same. Now, this came up very recently because we're seeing some psych NPs, which are wonderful and very much needed. But did she have the, uh, the primary curse, uh, care courses to complete? She didn't have to, to be a psych NP. You need to understand that. Has she completed the formal academic year? Does she have four months of classroom instruction to supervise clinical practice? And has she performing the expanded role for a total of 12 months? Read in the regulations on the, the definition of an NP. She, the point here is the psych NP, if that's all she ever did, does not qualify to be the NP in your clinic running for the 50% of the hours and the one that's employed. She does not qualify. All right. She could if she had all those extra courses. And it goes both ways. Okay. Some do, some don't. 
Now, an NP and a PA, if you don't have one of those, there's a waiver that you must request after 90 days, and you'll get a year. We've not had anybody ever denied that. And some locations that are just about 45 minutes from a larger city where they can go and make more money, um, they have a tough time sometimes maintaining their NPs because we can't afford to pay like the cities pay. So that can happen. So the first 90 days from the date that she leaves, you'll document your efforts to find a new NP or PA. And then at 90 days, you're going to write to the state for a waiver and they will normally grant it. But during that waiver time, you must document every effort you made to uh, find an NP. There is no locum for NPs and PAs. That is not acceptable. For whatever reason, it's not allowed by CMS. Now, the clinic is not required to have a midwife, social worker, or clinical psychologist. If they are on staff, they can only function within their scope. So this happened the other day, uh, the other week, a podiatrist and an NP both had full schedules for the day. The NP's uh, child got very sick at school and she had to leave. And so that left the podiatrist with a day full of patients and no clinical provider in the clinic. So you answer this question, could, could that podiatrist see patients all day in the clinic? And the unfortunate answer is no. Now, I know podiatrists, they don't have any provider in the clinic. This is a rural health clinic rule, and it was a tough one. I don't know what they did. I don't want to know what they did, but um, that's the rule. So an NP, PA, midwife is able to furnish patient care at least 50% of the operating hours. Now, if you're on the line, you want to track and log it well. If you are full-time NPs, don't worry about it. It's not going to be not going to be an issue. Remember I said all time spent in the clinic counts toward the physical 50%, including admin time, just document it, and time in the patient's home or sniff also. So how do you document that time? So that if you are challenged, if you're close to the 50% line, you have a way to prove that you're good, that you are in compliance. And that looks like that is a duplicate side. So I remember to get that out of there. Okay, medical record review. Now, if your state is silent, then you determine how many and how often this occurs. What does your policy say? So I didn't look it up real quick. Somebody could put it in the chat. What does Indiana say about policy review, a medical record review, excuse me, uh, in Indiana? If it gives a number, then that's your number. If it doesn't give a number and more than half the states don't, then you decide and it's going to be based on the experience of your NP and PA. How, how many years have they been at it, so to speak? Okay, so we were, if, you, if she's new, you might want to do 10 a week. If she's been there for 30 years and doing wonderful care, knows when to speak to the medical director or a, a physician when she's got a problem, you might put five a quarter. Either way, write the number in your policy. Then the surveyor is going to ask to see evidence. Who are the five patients that Dr. So-and-so reviewed on that nurse practitioner last month? And there will be a list of names and a signature at the bottom. If you do it through your EMR, make sure you can print a report that verifies that. All right. So you must have documentation one way or another that that record review was done. Now that's medical oversight. That's the medical director deciding and it can be the collaborative physician, it does not need to be the medical director, deciding that the care that was delivered was exemplary, that we did the right treatment, we prescribed the right drugs in the right doses, we handled, we ordered the right tests, all that. It's a medical review. We're going to talk about a second kind of review that often gets confused. This came up very recently. Can a clinic be 100% telehealth? And the answer is no. You can have telehealth and now it's extended through the end of 24 and you should, that's good, but you must ensure that there's staff available to handle medical emergencies. And if everybody's home doing telehealth, you cannot, you must have a provider in to be a rural health clinic in the clinic. 51% primary care services, actually RHC services. This is a hot button right now on how it's measured. So you would have to know, I suspect how your state measures it. Here's how we measure it. We measure it by the visit type. So if you are very heavy in um, mental health, particularly in substance abuse, and those telehealth visits count, but all those patients, so let's say you're 60% substance abuse, didn't all those patients come in for other issues? Didn't they get sore throats, earaches, flu shots, all the rest of it? So we were measured by the 
type of visit. And if the type of visit is a primary care visit at 51% or more, you pass. So think about that. We are working with CMS to get this fixed. We need, we desperately need specialists and mental health in rural health clinics. And uh, it's becoming, uh, with, especially with telehealth, it's becoming an issue. So uh, I would also love to see CMS allow mental health to be called primary care medicine, because you and I both know that it is. When this was written in 1977, mental health was pretty much institutionalized folks and schizophrenia and all those things. Now, every one of your providers is seeing patients for anxiety, sleeplessness, all the things that go that go in primary care medicine. So that should not count as mental health in my humble estimation. That's me speaking. Primarily engaged, as I said, is that your services um, are commonly furnished in a physician's office at the entry point into the healthcare delivery systems. So RHCs are not prohibited from furnishing other services, but cannot pr be primarily engaged. So does your website reflect the type of services you offer? Does it include specialty services? What does that look like? Review the hours that specialty services are offered to determine the number of hours that is the majority of time. That is the Appendix G way to measure that. And you may be held to that in the state of Indiana. So your policies much must match your process. So uh, read your policies and make sure you're doing it that way. So some clinics still have an annual consent in their policy that we're going to get a consent every time a patient, once a year, a patient comes in. So if we see that, we're going to cite to the policy that's not required to have a consent every year. If you want that, that's fine, but you're going to be held to that. So um, that's your choice. And the second is some people still say annual evaluation in their policy when it's biennial. So therefore, if we're surveying your clinic and you didn't do one this year or for 22, you're out of compliance and you're going to get a citation. So it's to the federal regulation and your policy. What does your policy say? So just make sure that's why we do policy review to make sure we're doing things the way we um, we in our policy, the way we're doing them. And that happens to everybody. We're all so busy. So keep your policies organized, review a few policies after each staff meeting. So you don't have to do them all at once every two years, and then keep your policies simple. Like I said, don't lock yourself in a corner and say, oh, we're gonna get a consent every time the patient walks in the door. Well, that's a challenge and why would you do that? So, or we're gonna do 50 charts a week to, to make sure we're accurate. Great, but don't put it in your policy. You can do it. Go do it. That's wonderful. So know what requires a policy, patient care policies, biennial review of policies by an advisory group, storage, handling, and dispensing of drugs and biologicals, your emergency preparedness, of course, your health records, your HIPAA for sure, the scope of services that you provide and what you refer, your lines of authority, your equipment management, your infection prevention, your hiring, training, and orienting, and your quality improvement. That's the basic list of what we need in a rural health clinic. So the point of care tests are those for immediate diagnosis, and you must have the ability to do all six tests. The most common one missing, particularly in new clinics, is hemoglobin or hematocrit. Now remember, and it's missing most commonly in provider-based clinics because you send those tests over to the hospital. And we understand that. So I'm on the board of NRHA and we are working. It's in the law. We just need the law to be passed. The new law will say labs are readily available. Whoa, what a treat that'll be. So we don't have to go buy that HEMA-Q machine when we are going to draw a CBC anyway. But for now, if you're survey, you have to have the ability to do all six of those tests. That means all your reagents, your strips, your controls are in date. You must have a CLIA certificate that's current and posted. And then next, how are abnormal lab labs reported to your patients? Has the note in the chart reflected that the patient's been notified and what is the plan moving forward? Make sure we have that in our EMR. And then, of course, what instructions are given to the patients with regards to abnormal labs? What is your process for abnormal labs? Kate? Yes. We did have a question. I'm sorry, I wanted to let you get through those points, but if the primary purpose of the RHC is walk-in in nature, will that still be, uh, quote unquote, safe in the visit count? What do you mean safe? Whoever uh, submitted that question, do you want to elaborate on that? Please.
Can you unmute yourself? Attendees uh, cannot unmute. They can use the raise hand function uh, and we can allow them to ask questions at that point. Uh, okay, if if you would like to raise your hand, we'd be happy to unmute your line as well. Um, or if you'd like to, to clarify in the Q&A box. Okay. Yeah, so it just gonna... says, if the primary purpose of the RHC is walk-in in nature, will that still be safe in the visit count? But we'd like that to know exactly. A, that is absolutely a visit. You bet it's a visit. Now, we have many, I mean, over 200 now, uh, walk-in clinics that are rural health clinics. So they're, they're, their business is urgent care, even though we don't use that word because it's often fraught with licensing issues. So for those walk-in clinics, if I come in there with a broken finger to your walk-in clinic, because I just smashed it with a hammer, um, and you're going to x-ray it and splint it, right? Then that's a visit. However, that chart must be complete. So you're going to ask me what my meds are. You're going to do a little quick review of systems and, and ask me what I'm allergic to. All the things that are in a regular, but it's certainly a visit, even no matter what I'm there for. Absolutely. And it's actually a good model because, because it's a good, if you have five clinics and one is just walk-in, you can use that as a referral base to all your other clinics. So the most important thing for those walk-in clinics is what's your referral look like. So if I came in with... Um, a uh, sugar out of control and you dipped and I've got a, a sugar of 170 or 80 or whatever. Um, what are you going to do for me? Where are you going to send me? Immediate solution? Yes. But what are we going to do about it? So I think the, I think I answered the question. It is absolutely a visit. It is safe for visit. Safe was the part that got me. So yes, I, I believe you did because they followed up. It acts more like an urgent care. So I wasn't certain how many general primary care visits are done, but I, I do think you captured that Kate in your answer. Yes. It absolutely counts as a visit and you can be 100% walk-in. Remember that it's a good model, especially I'm getting a little off script here, but especially with people like Dollar General talking about care. We all have a Dollar General in our communities. If we're rural, everybody uh, or the other one, there's two dollar ones, uh, which is a dollar and a quarter now. But at any rate, they're coming to town. If you don't have extended hours and the ability to walk in, you're going to lose to them. And we don't want that to happen. We do not want that to happen. Good question. Okay, for emergency services, you must ensure that you have the ability to handle a medical emergency in your clinic. So that means a, a, a little portable box, it must be portable, that has your emergency drugs in it. Now, the, the emergency drugs that are in it are listed in your emergency service policy. There's a reason for that. The reason is the medical director signed off on that policy and said, okay, these are good. This is exactly what we need at this street corner. CMS was gracious about that to allow you to decide what you need at your street corner. If your clinic is in the hospital 30 feet from the ED and there is a crash cart there, well, you might not need as robust a box as the one 30 miles down the road where it's going to take a bit of time for an ambulance to get there. So it's a different box. And so that's wonderful uh, give, I think. And none of those things that are listed in the regulation are required anymore. The antibiotics, the emetics, the toxins, all that, not necessarily anymore. So make sure you have that list. Does it match your process? So I like to have the list near the box so we can compare them, make sure they're up to date. Obviously nothing's expired in that box. And is the box check, check regularly for outdates? The box should be near your tank of oxygen. So when we have a 911 uh, in the clinic, somebody's calling 911 and other people are running, grabbing the equipment and getting to the patient room to care for the patient. Patient records, okay. And I mentioned this already with the medications. Is the EMR capturing the medication, the lot number, the route of administration, the dose and the date? Does the EMR note uh, clinical monitoring for meds, which are contraindicated. And I've not seen an AMR that doesn't do that. And then of course, are the allergies uh, noted in the app, in the labs, are the abnormal findings authenticated? And uh, uh, there's a note about what we did about the abnormal, that the patient was notified. I will add, if you're putting abnormal labs in a portal and expecting me to look at them, you've got to find a way to know that I did look at them. OK, so do you have a flag system so that if I didn't log into my portal for three days post that, then you get a flag and you're going to call me and say, hey, Kate, your labs were abnormal. All right. Make sure of that, because we're not going to assume that Mrs. McKillicuddy looked into her labs, especially someone who's up there like me. Summary. Is there a documented summary of the visit? What did we do today? What we found? What's the plan moving forward? When do you want to see me again? Six months, next week, whatever. 
And does each patient have a record? And there are not two records in the clinic for two types of services. There's one patient record. Okay, this is our own little bugaboo. This is a thin prep. If you look up thin prep, you will not believe how, how dangerous that stuff is, even inhaling it. So if a kid gets into one of those while mom's on the table, somehow things happen. You know, you don't have to wonder something will happen. Um, and, and that's even just breathing it. Skin contact, irritation, and ingestion uh, can really do serious damage. So we like the thin prep to, does not need to be locked. It's going to be in a cabinet above counter level. And the person coming in to do the pap smear grabs one and sits down to do the pap. So let's not keep it in that drawer. That is a risk. For wart removal, which is mostly what I see the liquid nitrogen for, if you have a very large container and you're dispensing it into a small container to go into a patient room, you must have eye goggles and heavy duty gloves. This is fraught with issues when they're dispensing it from that large to small container and they, this, your staff can burn themselves. So let's, let's keep them safe. So in the, in the posters in your clinic, you have an OSHA poster, uh, proper PEPE in your clinic and your SDS sheets. The SDS sheets for the most part are electronic at this point, but does everybody know how to find them and get there? If you have something that's a, a typical problem in terms of uh, an injury, like a five gallon pump of disinfectant. And when they push that plunger down, it splatters, then let's have everybody know what the, what the remedy is. We're washing those eyes out quickly, whatever. Exam tables. How do you clean that table? What's the wet time? Does a health grade disinfectant, and it must be a health grade disinfectant, not something you bought at Target, okay? Can a torn table be disinfected? The answer is no. We don't know what's growing in there. We cannot disinfect that. Now, can you pass survey? Well, for us, you can uh, if you've duct taped that spot and can show us a work order that you've put in with the local, and I'll tell you who does this, car repair shops do a great job. They'll even match the color. And you put that into the, uh, into the show the surveyor and you'll pass survey. It's going to be fixed. It just didn't get there yet, okay? But that cannot be disinfected. It's very important that we, you do not need to buy a whole new table. They're very, very expensive. We're going to ask the, uh, typically the MA who wipes that table down, what is the wet time of that disinfectant? They range from 30 seconds to three minutes. If it's three minutes and you pull the paper down right away, all you're doing is sucking it up into the paper. You're not disinfecting anything. So wipe the table, go get a patient, bring them back. And then as you walk in the room, pull the paper down. No, no problem with that. You want everything to be disinfected that needs to be disinfected. Now, throughout COVID, we've seen some issues with this because somebody thought there had to be a meeting for a biennial. Yes, a meeting is a good idea, but it is not a requirement. It's the report that's the requirement. So they didn't do it. Guess what? No biennial evaluation is a failed survey. Not good. Now you're gonna be seen within 45 days and you better get that done. And that's a lot of work to get done. So this must be done every two years. There is no waiver for this. Look at the date of the last one. That's your third assignment. You're going to go look at the date of your last biennial evaluation, and you're going to make sure it's not more than two years old. And if it is, if it says April of 21, you're going to get going on that today because you don't want to fail survey because you didn't do that. OK, we don't want that to happen for anybody. Emergency preparedness, of course, has been in the news for a couple of years now. There's all kinds of emergencies, um, obviously, natural disasters, power grids, and emerging infectious diseases. CMS wants us to all have that as one of our hazards right now. So emerging infectious disease or EID is one of your risks and how you're gonna manage it. So that's new. Um, also, your exercise must be one of the ones listed on your HVA, unless it's an event, event takes care of everything. So if you're in Indiana, and I'm trying to think, if you get tornadoes, I don't, let's assume you don't, I don't know the answer to that. So if you don't get tornadoes, then you would never do an event, an exercise, a tabletop exercise on tornadoes. Why? Why would you test something you're not going to see? But if you do get tornadoes and it's on your list, then you can exercise that. So the point is you do your exercises, your tabletops on things that are on your list. Okay. 
and refer to the facility's risk assessment to determine if the training and testing is reflecting the risks you identified. Now your communication plan is complete, including the name and contact information for all staff, local, regional, state, tribal, and federal emergency staff. For tribal, you can do an NA if there's no tribal clinic within 50 miles of your clinic. And so they're not going to be much help to you anyway. Remember that you have to add a, another rural health clinic or an FQHC. You don't need to ask them. You're putting their name and phone number in your book. That's all. Volunteers must be addressed. We know we don't see volunteers in rural health clinics, but we know when we have an emergency, who are the volunteers? Your staff, their their families, your patients, anybody who's able-bodied and able to help is going to be your volunteer. But if you don't address it in your policy, you're going to have a deficiency. So in your policy, you can write, um, ABC Clinic has made the decision not to utilize volunteers. 100% acceptable, okay? And that that's, uh, shouldn't be any problem anywhere. We've not had any state surveyors object to that. If you want to have volunteers, you're going to name them. You're going to HIPAA train them and you're going to train them on your EP. And I hope they're there the day there's an emergency. May there never be an emergency. Now your training, the only way we know that you've trained anybody without asking a ton of questions is a signature page and dated, not a typed list, but a signature page. And at the top, it says EP training, April 19th, 2023. And that also should not be more than two years ago. So on the testing, you must participate in a full-scale exercise that's can be community-based or when not, then an individual facility-based, and mostly we see facility-based. If one year is a full-scale exercise or event, the next year is a tabletop. So with, with having COVID last year, probably most of you wrote that up this year, pick a nice tabletop and exercise one of those things on, on your list. Analyze, the word analyze, remember that. You did an event, you did a tabletop exercise, or you did a full-scale exercise, and you didn't analyze it. And that'll be a mark against you. You don't want that. So the exercise, the, excuse me, the analysis is what did we learn? What are we going to do better? What do we need to work on? That kind of thing. They don't want you to test the same thing year in and year out either. So don't pick power, power outage every year, even though we have them. <clears throat> Sorry. So the analysis is to uh, is to analyze the event results, identify your strengths to build on, identify potential areas for further improvement, support the development of corrective actions that will guide future emergency preparedness initiatives. We don't know what's coming next. We hope nothing like the last three years. And then after that, review the report with your staff, give some assignments and an attendance log, okay, at that meeting. So we all know what we didn't do right, what we need to do better, and praise for those things we did. You did a phenomenal job in the last three years. Uh, once we got ma enough masks and hand sanitizers, you started doing telehealth like, telehealth like crazy and did a great job at that without having any experience at it. So then let's review real quick the summary of the common deficiencies. Vials, single dose dated, drugs not secured, NP or PA not signing off on policies, very important, every two years, no analysis of that emergency event or exercise, not having all the contact information or EP binder. I know you've got it in your phones. It's got to be in your EP list. No documentation of chart review. We didn't talk about chart review. That's the completeness review. Have we hit all our markers? Have we called out all the labs? Is there consent for every patient? Do we have a summary? Uh, do we identify the patient, 56-year-old white female comes in today for whatever, all that. No outside person signing off on the policies. On the policy review, there's three people that sign off, the medical director, the NP or PA, and one person who is not an employee of the clinic. It can be someone from the hospital for you provider-based clinics, but independents have to find someone to be that outside person. The signage not matching your name and then expired supplies. I would say number 10 is on almost every survey. We find stuff. So make sure when you're doing your monthly rounds, go through all the, um, all the drawers, the gloves, the blood glucose, the blood tubes, the electrodes for the EKG, the electrodes for the AED, the pads, all those things have dates on it. So make sure you're catching all those. Now, we're coming up on May 11th, where the, um, the waivers are going to end for the most part. We're not telehealth, you know, is going to 2024, and there'll be a lot of change in that through the year, I think, as we uh, 
get the Congress to work on that. But the physician supervision of NPs and RHCs was waived. And this one is unique. This flexibility is currently set to return to a pre-PHE rules at the end of this calendar year. So your physician uh, oversight chart review ends December of 23. And that's an unusual one. I don't know why they did that, but maybe it's because as the last sentence says, they're exploring options to make this flexibility permanent. It would be especially nice in states where there is autonomy of the NPs. It would just be wonderful, but we're not there yet. But the exempt, the waiver is extended to the end. That doesn't mean your medical director goes away. And I wouldn't even recommend you stop this, but it is a waived thing right now. Your temporary expansion waivers, if you've often opened a clinic somewhere else to separate sick from well, we see this a lot in the pediatric clinics, that other location is done May 11th. Now it doesn't have to close. It doesn't, it's just not an RHC. You can't build it under your rural health clinic. You can build it as fee-for-service. You can apply to become a rural health clinic if it's in a, a rural uh, HIPSA. And so, but right now that's ending on May 11th, no longer billing through that secondary location. So can the staff articulate what they're responsible for? If asked, what do you have to get fired around here? Do they know the answer? Have you ever taught them what your fraud, waste, and abuse policy looks like? If asked, what do you have to do to evaluate the, evacuate the clinic and they can't answer, you've never had a fire drill and you should. There's no law that says you have to have a fire drill every year, but boy, you should have a process and practice that once a year. And your staff should be able to answer questions related to their job responsibilities, as I said. <clears throat> so um, for 42 CFR 48826 says the decision as to whether there is compliance depends on manner and degree. So if just a, a quick thought on this for standard versus condition level, let me just say standard level, you write, we write a statement of deficiencies, you write a plan of correction, tell us when it's going to be fixed within 60 days and we're on our merry way. You're still uh, certified, well, you're still certified and accredited if you're with us. If it's, if it's got a, a large degree to it uh, or has anything to do with patient uh, health and safety, it's going to be a condition level deficiency like that vial situation. So in many instances, a standard level deficiency can lead to a condition level. So if we're looking at 20 charts and five don't have a consent, it's standard level, but 15 don't have a consent, it moves to condition, it's more than 50%. So those are the kinds of things, if you don't understand that, you can go to 48826 and read about how these decisions are made. Your plan of correction then must, must contain the action that will be taken to correct each deficiency, the process that led, how did this happen? It's important to know that because then you can correct it. Description of how the actions will correct or improve, monitoring procedures to say that it stays compliant. The title, when you're writing a POC, never put a person's name. There's one signature at the bottom. You'll see even the surveyors have a number. The titles are nurse practitioner, MD, uh, receptionist, MA, CNA, those kinds of things. Never a name. They're discoverable documents. So we don't want a name. On the signature of the administrator is the only signature at the bottom of the page. So all surveys are unannounced, as you know. Managers share your knowledge with your staff. Most surveys we take between six and nine hours, usually eight. Once in a while, it takes two days, depends on what's going on. And if you have 40 rooms. Now, unannounced is unannounced, but if we're coming to, to your, your health system and doing five surveys that week, you all know on day one that we're here and we're not leaving until they're all done. So then we work out a plan with you to do the next four days. It's, it really works well because certain managers want to be at certain ones and all that kind of thing. And remember, easy access to your policies, records, medical records, as they are requested by the surveyor. And then at the end, you have an exit interview. So you know at the end of the day just what went on, and you can start making corrections right away. So some keys to success. Leadership needs to make safety a priority in your clinic culture, for sure. Share information. I can't say that enough with every person. Train, train, and then train some more. Implement systems that can be sustained. That's why I say don't lock yourself in the corner. That's something so difficult you can't maintain it. Test what you have trained on. Don't assume. Involve staff in your goal setting for safety. Everybody wants to be involved. It's our clinic. And if I didn't say it before, compliance is a team sport. No one person can keep track of all of this. Let's have, let's have responsibilities within the clinic. Coordinate and collaborate. 
clarified terms, and then always in every company, mine included, communicate, communicate, and communicate some more. Okay, and we made it within an hour. So, so we have time for some questions. Are there any? I haven't had any more come in, but we'll certainly give it a moment here if anybody would like to submit additional questions. Again, you can either use the chat function or the Q&A function to type in your question. If you would rather ask your question verbally, as I mentioned earlier, you can use the raise hand function and we will unmute your line. You'll be able to ask your question directly then. So we'll give it just a minute or two here to see if any more questions come in, Kate. But just, man, what a, a ton of information for us there. <laughs> Uh, I want to turn my camera on so I can say hi, and I'm looking forward to hope you'll all come to French Lick in June so we can meet. Yes, indeed. French Lick, uh, are one of our best events of the year, and Kate herself will be there. Um, we did get another question. Is there a checklist on the Indiana Rural Health site? No, I don't believe we have one listed, but if, uh, Kate, if you have that available, um, I I can send we, it. We can I, definitely post that in our resources tab. Uh, okay. Also, if those on the call have not um, interacted with Nicole Watkins on the Indiana Rural Health Association staff, she is our RHC expert in Indiana. Um, if she doesn't know the answer, she knows where to get you the answer. Right. Um, so That's she's a great, a great person to engage with. And I know she works closely with Kate quite a bit. She's an, she's an excellent uh, resource for you, yes. Absolutely. All right. I guess we don't have any more questions. I hope you're not overwhelmed, but you, you got my email. I hope I didn't know why I didn't it stop sharing. I didn't mean to stop sharing. You are screen sharing, but nothing's showing, huh? It looks like you went to the end there of your slideshow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Please email me. I get questions all day long. And so I'm happy to answer your question. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so we'll go ahead and give everybody a couple minutes back in their day. Thank you once again, Kate. You're very welcome. Take care.